Okay, I'd like to welcome you um, to um, the Institute for Advanced Studies at Loughborough University and this series of conversations, the Loughborough Conversations. Um, my name's Emily Keatley and um, this is Professor David Lyon. We're absolutely delighted to have you with us. Professor of Law and Professor of Sociology at the University of Queen's, um, Kingston, Ontario, um, and Director of the Surveillance Studies Centre um, at Queen's and also the principal investigator of um, the Big Data Surveillance Project um, that's funded by Research Council um, in Canada. You studied at the University of Bradford um, and then have since moved um, to, to Queen's and you're most well known, I think, it's fair to say, for your work in surveillance studies, kind of key and leading figure in the field. And your early work, the electronic eye, um, um, back in 1994, I think, was one of the, one of the most important books uh, written on surveillance. And you've written a number of books since then. Um, and most recently, I think you've got a book forthcoming on surveillance culture, I think, uh, which we're going to touch a little bit on today. Um, so welcome and thank you for joining us. Good to be here. If we could just start off with a little bit about your intellectual background, uh, that would be that would be great. So I just wanted to ask you, you're, you're most well known for your work in surveillance studies um, and you, your, your important contributions to that field. But your early career actually focused on quite a different area, which, which people might not be quite so aware of. And it was the relationship between um, religion and, and the social sciences. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that body of work and particularly what what started that interest? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I mean, right from when I was an undergraduate, I was not only kind of struggling with intellectual issues that were coming at me in all directions, but I was also trying to make sense of the kind of faith tradition in which I'd been raised and about which I'd become very skeptical. Um, but at the same time, I realized that I was grateful for aspects of it. So I was trying to work out my own position in relation to a Christian tradition in which I found myself, but I was wanting to uh, discover my own way in. And so um, I, I started to try to work out, okay, well, what does it mean to be someone who wants to hold religious commitments, Christian commitments in my case, in the social sciences. And so I, I set off reading Marx, Weber, Durkheim and co with a sense of trying to not only understand what they were saying, but how it related to those commitments that I was increasingly holding dear. And so that was really how I, how I got into that. And then I started writing about what I, uh, when I was a graduate student, I was writing about what uh, I was discovering and and so on. So I, I, one or two of them made it into book forms. I wrote about Marx and tried to contribute in a minor way to what was then thought of as a Christian Marxist dialogue. Uh, I wrote about humanness in relation to some key strands in sociological thought. So I was trying to work something out for myself and sometimes, as it were, out loud by writing it down to try to maybe stand alongside other people who were going through similar struggles. So that was how I got into those kinds of activities. That's really helpful, thank you. Um, there's been an increasing body of work on, on post-secularisation, yeah. post-secular cultures. And obviously um, with the discernible rise in fundamentalism, that's, that's become increasingly pertinent. I just wonder yeah. if you've got any reflections on, on the role of um, studies about the post-secular in today's society. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still fascinated by it. It's not as if I sort of left it behind mm -hmm. and went into surveillance studies instead. I continue to be interested in those questions and I think they're tremendously important. The very idea that was promulgated by some uh, early social scientists that somehow uh, a human religious phase was being left behind and we were now heading into something different. It, it strikes me as being so mistaken and in the 21st century so obviously mistaken, palpably so. And so, yeah, once again I'm still trying to think through those issues and increasingly seeing how they relate to the work that I have been doing for the last, what, 30 years or so in surveillance studies because I think it's far from irrelevant. Um, 
I mean, I, I, I could take that further. If, if we think in terms of surveillance studies, when I started before the electronic eye, uh, that really began by thinking about information society in the first place and then realizing when I decided to write a book about it, I got to chapter five in my plan, which is really about surveillance. It doesn't use the word surveillance very much, but it's all about surveillance. And when I got there, I thought, why are people not writing about this? This is such an important area. And so it was striking me profoundly that it was very important. But then I started reading Bentham and Foucault and so on, and realizing that actually Bentham's work is situated right at a crucial kind of uh, cusp of uh, political activity and intellectual uh, development. So on the one hand, he was trying to be a self-defined secular, by which he meant a religious uh, participant. So he actually quotes from the biblical Psalms at the uh, right in the preface to the Panopticon uh, papers, if you like, within his work, and, uh, and, and then proceeds to describe something that is obviously a self-conscious, secular equivalent of this eye of God that uh, he was referring to from the biblical text. And simultaneously, his work politically was right into uh, a context within which at the time, an evangelical party in uh, Britain was working on prison reform. And again, his plan was to write something that was distinctively not Christian in the midst of this uh, melange of ideas that actually came out of a very Christian tradition. I mean, Bentham went on to found University College London and so on as the explicitly non-Christian university. So, you know, the, I, I, I found myself being unable to evade those questions that had concerned me so much in terms of uh, that earlier intellectual development uh, when I came to surveillance studies. And now that we've got to surveillance studies, I'd like to just ask you a few questions about how you see the field um, and um, what you think the major kind of uh, intellectual influences and, and kind of theoretical influences are in the study of surveillance in, in, in contemporary work? Well, they are manifold. Surveillance studies is a transdisciplinary area, transdisciplinary field of studies, if you like. And it's a, it's a field that therefore has many intellectual currents flowing into it. And um, while there are some that are dominant, and I mean, I, I, I came out of an historical background first and then uh, sociological. And so I have always tended to think that some of the insights from sociological theory are particularly pertinent here. But, you know, other colleagues will come from international relations or from uh, criminology and policing studies, and, and, and they have somewhat different angles on these matters. So it's very hard to say what is dominant in the field. I mean, people often uh, invoke the name of Michel Foucault. And of course, Foucault is important, but I think, you know, in that case, uh, there are also people who have argued creatively with Foucault, people like Ian Hacking, people like uh, Michel de Certeau, people like, um, well, in, in the present day, DJ Bigo. Um, and out of those creative struggles with the work of Foucault, there are uh, important outcomes, I think, in, in, social, in uh, studies of surveillance. But the sociological writers, I think, still have a lot, of, a lot going for them. And in fact, I, I go back to Marx and Weber and Durkheim sometimes, because that seems to me to give crucially important clues uh, as to what has happened subsequently. And again, because of my background, I was also interested in people like Jacques Ellul, who for all that, I mean, I understand the reasons why he was somewhat marginalized. People who don't give all their, make clear all their references and sources are not necessarily welcome in the, you know, academic um, fraternity. But, um, you know, I found his work very stimulating and very interesting. And he was saying things that uh, Foucault and Deleuze and others would say later, back in the 1960s. 
And I found that prescience quite uh, striking, really. Um, his comments about policing and, and policing methods that were developing in the 1960s being ones that could not but lead to holding whole populations under surveillance rather than targeting. Well, that was decades before its time. So, you know, I, I, I find, in fact, I love those prescient moments when you see in someone's writing that they were discerning something that really was to become tremendously important later on. Thank you. Um, in terms of your own contribution to surveillance studies, um, I think one of the things that when I was reading your work um, I identified was the importance of moving beyond um, the, the straightforward connection between privacy and surveillance. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you could tell me a little bit about um, why you think it's important to move beyond understanding surveillance just in terms of privacy mm -hmm. and how you've sought to do that in your, in your own work. Yeah. It, it's true, I have. I, I, I hesitate though because um, I think there are reasons for not simply being sceptical about privacy orientations to surveillance uh, studies. One has to do with, and, and I think we'll probably come to this in other ways as we go along, one has to do with a kind of human desire not to be constantly visible or to, to feel that there are spaces where you are free from governmental constraint of one kind or another. And that often gets called privacy. So that's one reason. I think there's something uh, appropriately um, human about desiring such a, a space. But then secondly, so much debate over many decades has used the word privacy such that it is now enshrined in law. It is in policy instruments. It's in international declarations and agreements. And therefore, it's, it seems when some of the issues that we're looking at are so critical for democracy and for uh, equality and, and so on. When some of the issues are so critical, um, to turn one's back on a whole body of work and political activity that depends on the notion of privacy seems uh, somewhat beside the point. It's churlish to, to, to discard that. So that, that's what I would say positively about it. And I very much respect my colleagues who work in the area of privacy. But, having said that, um, I do think there are a number of issues with the term. Uh, it's, not, it's neither the antonym nor the antidote for surveillance, for a start. Uh, it's frequently associated with individualistic approaches that have to do with my privacy. I want to be protected. This is me. Well, you know, sociologists rightly say we have to see personal uh, troubles as public issues. We share them. Other people experience the same issues and they, they have to be dealt with uh, at, at a public level. So <sighs> privacy, I think, is frequently compromised with that kind of individualism. It's also been historically connected to property, for example. Um, you know, I, I think there are numerous issues with it that make it hard for us to uh, see, well, at best, how it can be the only way of confronting questions of surveillance. That move from the individual to the social yeah. in terms of the approach that you take to surveillance is, is, is a very, very interesting one. And some of the sort of strands of your work indicate a relationship between surveillance and social inequality. And I wondered if you could just say a little bit more about how you see that relationship. Yeah, well, I mean, let's start with Weber. Um, Weber wrote about uh, the kind of ways in which rational bureaucratic uh, organization developed. Um, I mean, he was writing in Germany and he was writing about something that he could see very clearly as, as a process. And one of the features of that rational bureaucratic development is the division of populations into uh, categories to classify in order to be able to treat different groups differently. 
which in itself, of course, is, uh, is, is, is perfectly understandable. Uh, if people are entitled to certain benefits from the state, for example, then to know clearly who has those entitlements and who, who does not qualify, that's really important. The huge question is not the actual process of discriminating between different groups, it's whether you know the criteria by which those discriminations occur and whether they have been democratically worked out, whether those who are subject to them are knowledgeable about how the criteria are worked out. And that, it seems to me, is where the critical issues arise, both in Weber's time and now in a vastly enhanced way today. Those are the real issues. I mean, today when we're thinking about algorithms and so on that embody those uh, modes of classification that are even more arcane and uh, impenetrable than those of classic bureaucratic organization. That's where the issues really arise. And that's why questions of inequality and uh, inappropriate, unfair treatment, those are the sorts of issues that arise from just that. In, in, in your work, you've been um, really active in kind of moving beyond, uh, you know, um, traditional understandings of the relationship between society and surveillance. And so um, pr in previous kind of um, theorizations, you've had the surveillance society and, and the, the surveillance state, and you're developing the idea of the surveillance culture. Mm -hmm. um, I wondered if you could tell us what surveillance culture is and how you would distinguish it between those, from those previous iterations. Yeah, yeah. So when I started working in surveillance studies, the, uh, the field was dominated by field. There wasn't really a field, but the, the, what writing there was, what research was being done, was dominated by interests in the state and national security, those kinds of things. Um, by workplace surveillance. I mean, our workplace surveillance was very important, very critical, and uh, some wonderful work was, was done that I think is, is now worth excavating and, and bringing into the present. Um, and uh, there were also questions about policing surveillance and so on. Uh, and there tended to be an association of state activity with surveillance and that that was where you would find it. Um, by the, and yeah, so state surveillance, by the, uh, towards the end of the century, more and more, however, people started talking about surveillance society. I mean, I joined them, I, I worked around the uh, surveillance society themes, and that was more to see the ways in which surveillance was spilling over the rims of the previous containers, the silos that had, as it were, contained surveillance within which surveillance was done in discrete realms. Uh, that seemed to be uh, beginning to erode. There were more poss possibilities for information sharing between different entities, uh, different departments, and between different organizations, in fact. And so, and, and it became more perceptible in everyday life. You know, from the 1960s, there had been um, surveillance cameras were appearing in, in various places, and that grew hugely in the 1980s, 90s. Uh, so people became more aware of it, and uh, you could talk more intelligently about surveillance society. I mean, still some of the key motifs that were discernible in workplace surveillance and state surveillance, like the social sorting that I was talking about, the dividing between different groups so that you can treat different groups differently. Um, that was visible too in, in surveillance society. Um, the notion of surveillance culture, yes. Now, uh, Im important things happened within that. The surveillance society was one in which people became more aware of surveillance in their lives, not just from cameras, but increasingly from other kinds of uh, particularly commercial activity, consumer advertising. Um, this was the era of um, database marketing, just, just beginning in the uh, 1980s, 1990s. And people began to you know, receive junk mail. Junk mail was something that became really important. And, and at that time, that was the only way of connecting with the advertising in a targeted way. You, you put it in mailboxes according to postcode. And um, 
And so that was, that people began to feel, well, how did they know that I was interested in this kind of a product? And so people became more aware of it. And that's what, I'm big, what I started to think of as a, a culture of surveillance, where people become aware of the experience of surveillance as it touches them in multiple contexts. And not only become aware of it and become, it becomes part of our experience and something we need to have to no negotiate in everyday life, but also something that people began to engage in, and this occurred particularly after the uh, turn of the century into the uh, early uh, 21st century. And so you had 9-11, uh, for example, uh, a very obvious development, massive development that, that actually uh, in part took up the fears uh, and the dashed hopes of the dot-coms that were around at the end of the 20th century. Suddenly here were people who were wanting their products and uh, of course it was a time of great opportunism among those corporations to sell to departments of homeland security and all the equivalents that emerged. So that was one thing. And then the other from 2004 or so, 2004 Facebook, um, is, is the moment at which the opportunities for uh, more engagement in surveillance, not just being surveilled, but starting to see that there were possibilities for lateral surveillance, for watching each other, as it were, for finding out about people, checking up on friends, of course, prominently, but also checking up on complete strangers. This became a phenomenon that, that grew and, of course, is still with us today. So uh, when I talk about surveillance culture, I'm thinking of something that is, uh, has to do with the emerging imaginaries and practices that relate to not only the experience of surveillance, which I think is critically important and had been underplayed in earlier surveillance studies, but also engagement with surveillance in everyday life. Yeah, I think what's fascinating in what you're saying is this move in surveillance studies from a focus on the state and the macro level um, activities in surveillance um, and this movement into the everyday, the movement into the vernacular. Um, and I wondered in that movement, you sort of hinted at it a little bit in your previous answer, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit more, um, on the role of human agency, how mm -hmm. you see people being able to act mm -hmm. in, in a surveillance culture and what that acting might look like. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, it's a really big question. And it's a question that has all kinds of dimensions. Uh, for example, let me just say something about one of the dimensions that I find utterly striking. Uh, and that's the gender dimension of it all. If you're talking about that kind of top-down operator view, as I call it, of surveillance, it's dominated by male writers, and frankly, male thinking. And um, if you start to talk about the experience of surveillance and the emotional life of uh, feeling that you're under surveillance, or even the emotional activity of being a surveillor, in, uh, in, in a context of using social media and following up clues and doing what really uh, is private investigations, then all those things are very gendered too, because especially the experiences of and the emotional life of surveillance. Uh, here's a field that is now, well, dominated, I suppose would be one bad word, uh, Many of the, let me put it a different way, many of the uh, researchers and writers on whom I've depended for trying to think about um, surveillance culture are a completely different group and more are women than men. So there's a curious gendering. It's sort of predictable in a sense, but it's also very striking. And uh, I, I, it's helped me to understand a whole series of things in, in some quite uh, different ways. It's not that I didn't think about it before. I've been obliged to think about it in new ways now, and I found it tremendously helpful. Um, your question had to do with, uh, with agency. Yeah, now I... Okay, I have to put this in, a, in a, a, a bigger context again. Let me just say that what's happening at that grand scale and what governs the, as it were, top-down forms of surveillance 
is increasingly something that uh, Shoshana Zuboff calls surveillance capitalism. And I think that her argument is very apposite to this situation. And within that, there is a very strong thrust to say that um, what is happening is, is kind of inevitable. It's, there's this untamable juggernaut that is rolling over us or that we can embrace and uh, you know it, it then becomes a vehicle that we can travel in it's not the negative connotations of the juggernaut it's something that if we join it then uh, this is uh, something that will produce all kinds of uh, positive benefits apparently that doctrine of inevitability that puts the focus on the technology you know the shiny new gadget, the gizmo, the bells and whistles, that it seems to me is an extremely dangerous way of thinking about the world, that somehow technology is coming. Technology does not come. Technology is socially and politically and economically rooted. It's the product of those processes and that's why it's so important that Shoshana Zuboff uh, and others draw our attention to surveillance capitalism, the actual mode of capital accumulation today is increasingly leaning towards the sucking up the extraction of data. And that, it seems to me, is the context in which we have to ask questions about agency. Agency, the very idea of agency, is resisted within that understanding of the world. And therefore, to assert it is not merely to you know, assert something that has been in the as it were, history of social thought for centuries, uh, but it's also to assert something that's politically appropriate, that there are alternatives to this, in this case, surveillance capitalist way of operating. So that's why I think it's important to, uh, to examine questions of agency and to see where agency is uh, exhibited, where it is visible, where we can, where we can find uh, agency. And that, I think, is the, is the critical question. And so I'm going to ask it, where do we find it? Yeah. Um, what do the, yeah, you talk about practices and imaginaries, and I think that's a really fascinating sort of pair yeah. and the re reciprocal relationship between them. I wonder if you can say a little bit more about what those practices look like yeah. and what those imaginaries look like and how they interact. Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm thinking of the imaginary, the surveillance imaginaries, as the uh, ways in which we see the world and our place in it in relation to surveillance. So uh, someone like the philosopher Charles Taylor talks about imaginaries and practices. And I lean on his work. He was, he was working in a different register, but I think the kinds of ideas that he had can be uh, translated into this surveillance register too. So it's, it's the, as I say, way we see the world and our place within it. And therefore it has to do with um, the, the dynamics of this world, well, why we would, um, you know, click the button that says we've read the terms of service, all, all those kinds of things are part of, that's the practice that comes out of the imaginary. We see that and we think of it as something that you don't read, you just click. And so our place in it is to just click it so we can get on with uh, whatever it is that we, we want to get into. And, um, and, and therefore it's the dynamic of, of, of life, but also the duties, because we're, we're saying that we're also, there's a normative dimension to it. We're saying that, yeah, this is, this is the way we go on in this, in this field. Um, and it's okay to do this. Um, and other people do it and they haven't seemed to suffer from having done it. And so, you know, we think it's okay. So there's a normative dimension to it as well. And the practices are, as it were, that which flow out of the imaginaries, and sometimes it's the actual practices that tell you what the imaginaries are, as is so often the case. The, the things we actually do are what give the, the real clue to uh, how, how we're operating. So that's, that's the way that I'm thinking about the imaginaries and, and practices. And together they, they make up the, that's the sort of warp and woof of the um, surveillance culture, which, by the way, I'm not thinking of something that is monolithic or uh, homogeneous. It's like any culture, 
though the term is a singular one, it refers to great diversity and difference and to volatility and, and movement. And so at this point I let Raymond Williams speak to uh, the issues of surveillance culture and I say, well, there's a dominant surveillance culture probably that um, will enthuse about each new um, smartphone and will uh, upgrade as soon as they can afford it and, and so on and so forth. And then there are, as well as that dominant one that sort of echoes or mirrors or shadows the surveillance capitalism, there are also residual approaches. Uh, Williams called them residual approaches and I'm applying it to today. So the residual approach would be the, the, the voice, as it were, from behind or before this development that says, well, actually, I, I, actually, I, I value some face-to-face -face relationships and I find that uh, this always being online is, is somewhat problematic and I, I, I don't feel quite as secure and confident when I'm only online. And so there's a, a voice, as it were, from a, a pre-social media mm. stance, if you like. And then there will also be voices, emergent voices, that, uh, that will be asking about, well, what, what, what are the, the best ways forward now? So we have a lot of uh, hacker culture. We have a lot of uh, people who argue about the importance of encryption and so on. And they're trying to speak from, as it were, the edge from where most of us are not yet. And, and, and they're speaking into the situation uh, from, from a different perspective. Um, and also, I should say this, when I write about surveillance culture, I, I, I also think that we've downplayed the need for new metaphors and new memes for understanding what is going on. And so one of the things that I say is really for all the good things that Orwell says in 1984, in the 21st century, why are we still allowing our imagination? Why are we still allowing our metaphors to be dominated by ones that were produced in a completely different context of post-war England? and uh, not allowing something like Dave Eggers, The Circle, to give us some clues about how to think about contemporary surveillance. And really, Eggers is writing both about surveillance capitalism, without calling it such, and surveillance culture, without talking about, about, about it as such. Why? Because he's writing a novel. And it's a really excellent novel. I mean, it has its clunky moments, but it is a really good novel. Not so much the film, but the novel um, for understanding exactly these things, the, the role of agency. Uh, you can do a Raymond Williams kind of analysis on the circle and say, oh yeah, Mercer is the, um, is the residual, the, you know, the, the residual voice. And it, well, uh, we won't get into the need for spoiler alerts, but it does seem to me that you can do that and you can begin to see the role of imaginative literature in relation to those kind of social science uh, analyses. I've never tried to write about a novel in a book that I've written before. Culture of Surveillance, I've tried to write about The Circle, devoted a whole chapter to it, and it's kind of you know, terrifying to go into new, <laughs> new areas, but I felt that it was really necessary because we do have to develop a new vocabulary. We do have to develop new uh, metaphors for understanding. We've talked a bit about agency, um, and I'd like to sort of develop that a little bit. Mm -hmm. And you use the term in your recent work, digital citizenship. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could explain what you mean by the term digital citizenship mm -hmm. and why the digital is so important in, in terms of our understanding of citizenship in, in a surveillance culture. I think it's a great question, but it, again, it's something that we, we need to be considering. I think of it as a, a concept, digital citizenship, as a concept that um, alerts us to certain kinds of possibilities rather than a description of something that has developed. And I, in writing about something like surveillance culture and trying to work in a world that uh, is dominated by post 9-11 developments in security arrangements and uh, the rise of social media and so on, I think it's really important to, to think in terms of what new concepts are going to help us because some of the old ones wear thin and it becomes difficult to see how they play. I mean, most obviously, 
um, citizenship is primarily a concept that has to do with a nation state. It has to do with the relationship between the individual and the state in a nation state kind of context. What do you do in a world where uh, actually the corporations we're talking about and the security agencies that we're talking about are global, that they don't uh, observe national boundaries, nor do the kinds of questions that arise about um, rights and uh, the fulfillment of desire and so on in this world, they're not limited by nation-state boundaries. Nation-state boundaries are critical points at which they might be tested, of course, if you're trying to cross one, particularly if you're a refugee or a, a migrant of some sort. But they, the ways in which uh, we're limited by the old vocabularies becomes very clear. And, uh, and, and therefore, the notion of dig digital citizenship is intended to help think about the possibilities. And again, as in so many areas, I rely, I fall back on, I am inspired by others who are writing in the field. So Evelyn Ruppert and uh, Anger Nishin have written their book on uh, being digital citizens. And I think that that provides some clues about where we can go here. And they think of it particularly in terms of, well, where are rights claims or apparently right rights claims being made in this field? And by whom? And with what purpose in mind? So it's those kinds of issues that, uh, I was going to say circumscribe this area. It's not circumscribing it because it's, it's an open they're open possibilities. So digital citizenship, again, is citizenship that relates to these issues of what sorts of claims can be made about uh, the limits of surveillance, for example, uh, about possibilities for different ways of organizing, um, you know, platforms for social media type activity. They don't have to be like Facebook, they don't have to be like Twitter. Even in the academic world, we've ended up with, you know, platforms that are uh, supposedly academic platforms, but they so closely resemble Facebook and um, the, 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 the largest and, and best known platforms that you actually lose some of what is distinctive about academic life within those platforms. So is that the only way? Can we make claims for other areas, for other ways of doing, uh, and, and other ways of um, taking advantage of the affordances of those social media, which are pregnant with positive possibility? Do they have to be constrained in this way? So how can we make claims? How can we uh, demand, experiment with, other ways, other alternative ways. That's the sort of thing we're talking about in terms of digital citizenship, both claims that resist certain negatively construed types of digital development and simultaneously try to uh, nurture other kinds of green shoots that don't seem possible within the current regime. I want to come back to that idea of possibility in a moment, but just before we do, um, I wonder if you could tell us about your uh, current project, your PI on a, mm -hmm. on a very large um, big data surveillance project. And it would be fascinating to hear what the aims and objectives of that project are, and then the methods that you're trying to use to, yeah. to, 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 to achieve those. Yeah. Well, yeah, I feel tremendously privileged to be part of that project. And it's, uh, it is really very exciting. Um, and it's exciting for various reasons. Uh, for one thing, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada has funded us for quite a long time in a series of large-scale projects which are uh, multidisciplinary, collaborative, team-based, international, all of which I find hugely exciting and uh, full of possibility. But the fact that they've also funded us over a period of time means that I can work with colleagues that I have learned to trust and frankly to love. I mean, the, my team members, I feel like I have a really close relationship with them. And uh, I 
it's very humbling and I find it uh, wonderful to have that opportunity. But the, um, and, and therefore, and I, that's a preface because really what we're doing now about big data surveillance grows out of our previous project, which we call the new transparency, the ways in which uh, in everyday life, all of us are being more, becoming more and more transparent to large organizations that are simultaneously becoming less visible, less transparent to us. So that was the previous project and that in turn was building on the previous one. So there's a, there's a continuity here too. So the, the project that we're doing now doesn't stand alone. But one thing that struck us very forcibly when we were looking at the new transparency issues was the apparent shift towards big data, uh, data analytics, new forms of data capture. Again, from uh, 10, 15 years ago, apparently some rather definitive shifts towards big data, so-called. I really don't like the term, but it's the one that uh, encapsulates something we might understand in common. Um, and so, Yes, we wanted to see what differences were being made to the character of surveillance in the 21st century because of this uh, thrust towards big data analytics. And, th and that, was, that was, would determine the, the areas that we chose to focus on, um, national secu security questions, marketing, and uh, urban governance. Those are the, the three, but the, they're also interlinked. But one of the great things about this project too is that we were required under the terms of the grant to work with partners, not partners in a sort of minimalist sense of those who might be interested in our work once it's done or who might di direct us to some research areas that are important, but they're actually partners in the research. So we work with privacy commissions uh, Federal Privacy Commission, uh, British Columbia Privacy Commission, and uh, we also work with uh, advocacy and activist groups, so International Civil Liberties Monitoring Group, and uh, again, British Columbia Civil Liberties Association. So we have the opportunity to work directly with those people, and that gives us an interface, if you like, with people whose lives are actually touched in a profound ways sometimes by the kinds of surveillance processes that we're talking about. So that's another great dimension of the work that we're doing. And we chose those three because each of them is an area where the uh, activities of uh, turning to big data practices has become very evident and because they can be linked with each other so that there are cross links through the three themes. It's a team project and therefore uh, I kind of encourage and oversee the, the whole thing. Although I, I also had a place within the national security, or I have a place within the national security aspect of that. Uh, the marketing is critically important because uh, the, the world of um, corporate um, marketing is also being profoundly shaped by their attempts to use big data and equally urban governance. Um, I was just giving the example of uh, Google or Alphabet's Sidewalk Labs project in Toronto where um, the idea is to re revitalize a whole area of the city of Toronto uh, as Google says from the internet up. Uh, so all our residential consumption, entertainment, um, manufacturing, uh, transportation, whatever in this area is going to be a sort of, it's a Google city within the city. Now that is, there's your urban governance, kind of smart city idea, but here governed by a large corporation. Um, and uh, the corporate activities, the marketing, seen in many different ways. So within that, we're including voter surveillance, so political marketing, niche marketing. Uh, the name Cambridge Analytica has become important in this field, but it's by f not, the, not the only corporation that's doing it by any means. So that niche marketing, rather than the conventional, you know, democratic practice of informing the whole population about the policies of the political party, again, 
big data driven ideas and in national security um, well the uh, NSA GCHQ in uh, the UK communication security establishment in Canada during a discrete period of time shifted decisively to data analytics in Canada they called it the new analytic method and uh, we did a whole series of uh, freedom of in information requests and some studying of the actual development of this new uh, activity through understanding the new building that is housing this um, security agency to try to see whether this was the case. And of course the Snowden uh, disclosures gave very strong hints of that if you didn't have some clue of that of the fact that we were moving in that direction the Snowden disclosures made it very clear indeed. So that gives you I hope a kind of bird's eye view of this uh, project but as you can see I get very excited about it and uh, I think it is such a well it, as I said it's a humbling opportunity but it's also something that it's great to work in a team of the academics who are involved but also the team of people who are as it were at the interface between uh, ordinary people in everyday life who come with their complaints, their questions, their queries, their fears. Uh, and so we have, as it were, a two-way street there provided by our partnerships. Thank you. I just want to bring you back to that word you mentioned, possibility. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in sort of thinking about um, the future mm -hmm. of surveillance and of surveillance studies in terms of an area of research. And I was going to ask you what might surveillance look like over the next kind of um, decade or so. Mm -hmm. um, but perhaps what I would be more interesting is what should it look like, mm -hmm. um, given that we've been talking about agency and sites of different possibilities. I wondered if you could mm -hmm. just reflect on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we are at a very volatile time still. That it's it's not as if these things have uh, settled or congealed into something that is going to stay in the same shape for a long time. It may be that we're sort of past that possibility anyway of a a more stabilized way of doing things, and I'm not sure at all. I I uh, I, I wouldn't like to uh, you know prognosticate on such matters, but. Um, I certainly believe that for the foreseeable future, that's a strange phrase, what does foreseeable future means? I mean, um, anyway, for the time being we cannot but think in terms of surveillance because it is something that is hugely important in so many spheres and the very fact that a leading uh, thinker in the field like Zuboff can talk about surveillance capitalism as the very means of accumulation that is becoming dominant strikes me as being not only correct in itself but also highly um, uh, influential in terms of, um, well it's an insightful too as to how things are developing. But how should they develop? Well, I um, I like to work with the notion of human flourishing and I think that uh, some notion like that is very helpful. So much of the discussion of surveillance tends to be couched negatively, tends to be in terms of the downsides as it were, uh, and, and sometimes that can be positively sinister, threatening and so on. And uh, I don't think there's any need for that. I've never argued that surveillance is somehow intrinsically uh, socially negative. Um, and in fact, I've always tried to argue that there are possibilities. Uh, for example, I talk about a, a kind of continuum between care and control, that it's perfectly possible to conceive of surveillance and to find evidences of surveillance that is caring rather than controlling, and where you don't have to be simply cynical about the caring as a slogan that goes over something that is actually controlling. And of course, those ambiguities do occur as well. But the notion of human flourishing, I think, is, is helpful here. And it's interesting to me that something like the 2017 report by the Royal Society uh, on big data is structured around and aimed towards human flourishing. They use that term, which I, I find very interesting. Um, and, and why is this important? Because if we define a whole field, 
in negative terms as something that we want to avoid, resist, uh, and so on and so forth, then how do we know what it is that, we're, that we actually want? So I think a notion like human flourishing does help us here. And by human flourishing, I mean, for example, those things that are necessary for human life being assured. So obviously, um, food and water and shelter and all those kinds of things. But human flourishing is not only about those directly material things, it's about the quality of relationships, for example. It's about having, as I say, a sense of where we do want to go, of what a desirable future might look like. And uh, to think of the alternatives, to say the inevitability doctrine shuts us up and says that there is no alternative. What if we actually uh, make an alternative statement that there are alternatives and this is what they could look like? So, in, in the uh, Royal Society report on big data, they talk about it in terms of the ways in which we can uh, ensure and attempt to enhance democratic governance in this area. They start by saying that uh, human rights and liberties should be respected first of all, and, and, and so on. They, they argue about certain forms of transparency that are necessary. So, in other words, starting with where we would like to see things to go, uh, where we would like to see things go, rather than starting by saying, these are the things we don't want, this is the future we want to avoid. And so that human flourishing is, is important there. So I say, it includes things like relationality and what is enhanced and what is uh, constrained by certain you know, technological affordances that are now available to us. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's not just those purely material, as it were, aspects, but the, the relational, uh, the sense that one can be guided by a, a vision of a better, of better possibilities, that we don't live by bread alone. But there is a, a call, a word, something that pulls us towards uh, desires for a different kind of future. And I think that that is still possible to articulate within this. And digital citizenship may involve saying, yes, we're wanting to have a world that looks more like this than what we're currently experiencing. So those kinds of things animate my own work. Uh, and I'm trying to encourage others to think in those positive ways rather than merely ones that are uh, against the negative and constraining. So I think that's how I would sum up the, my hopes for surveillance, that not just that the worst aspects of surveillance, the excessive, the unnecessary, the unlawful, the constricting, the controlling, uh, might be reduced, contained, or eliminated, but rather that we might see surveillance where it is needed being developed in ways that are uh, for and with those uh, who are involved in surveillance rather than simply surveillance of or uh, a relationship of power over against. So those kinds of things seem to me to be perfectly, uh, well, of course we can dream of them, but they are also things that we can find ways of uh, actually embedding in our practices. I can't think of a better way uh, to finish, actually, than on that optimistic note, the idea of an open future and the possibilities that uh, thinking about surveillance differently has for us. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you, um, and thank you so much for joining us, Professor oh, David Lyon. Good to be with you. Thank you.